Welcome to the Qualitox Podcast, a show about pharma and GMP. I'm Jan Kugel, your host, and today my guest is Nathan Roman, the Director of Validation at Genesis AEC, continuing our podcast series. Nathan is passionate about thermal validation and loves helping people learn how to implement and carry out temperature mapping studies and equipment qualifications. Today's podcast will cover the steps to successfully validating a temperature-controlled chamber. I want to thank Upri, a leading temperature compliance service with the most innovative and stable solution on the market, for sponsoring this podcast episode. Hi Nathan, it's wonderful having you back on the show, continuing our podcast series about thermal validation. Our topic today is the steps to validating a temperature controlled chamber. Are you excited about it as I am? Hey, Jan. Uh, great to be here again. So thank you very much. And yes, I am excited. So let's get to it. So Nathan, before we get to the how, can you explain first what a temperature controlled chamber is and why those are needed? A temperature controlled chamber is a refrigerator, freezer, incubator, or a walk-in cold room that has an active temperature controller that can adjust the temperature inside that chamber, keeping... Uh, your desired temperature range for uh, the preparation or storage of your products. Temperature control chambers are very important in maintaining uh, quality attributes of those drug products, reagents, or samples that are temperature dependent and must be well sustained and controlled. So what types of temperature control chambers are out there and what different uses do they have? As previously mentioned, there are commercial off-the-shelf items such as refrigerators, incubators, freezers, and even uh, refrigerated delivery vehicles, uh, walk-in cold rooms, walk-in freezers, um, to built-in units such as warehouses, right? So they offer all different types of uses from uh, maintaining samples at room temperature or keeping products cool in a, in a nice refrigerated two to eight degrees Celsius or keeping items frozen um, and the typical freezer ranges are minus 20, minus 30, and the ultra low minus 80s. Um, but we also have cryogenic freezers or liquid nitrogen uh, va vapor storage. Some of these controlled uh, temperature units are used for storage of uh, bacteria plates and culture growth. So those would be 37 degrees Celsius uh, incubators. Those incubators are fitted with heating temperature only, but there are some testing labs that are equipped with cooling incubators. So you see there are all kinds of um, units out there that serve all different types of purposes. Thanks for elaborating on that. What can you tell me about the regulations that govern temperature control chambers and why do we need to validate them? There are many guidelines for different regions and from a variety of different agencies around the world. Most of them are uh, pretty good references and some actually provide excellent guides to mapping storage areas, but then some tell very little about how to conduct mapping studies. Um, so no single regulation or guidance out there um, supersedes the other, but I think the main consideration for temperature mapping studies uh, would be determines um, is determined by your specific product or um, application or industry. That's good to know. So let us now get to the more practical part of the podcast, the validation. Would you tell me please about the steps one needs to follow to validate temperature controlled chambers? Sure, Jan. Uh, I'd love to. So most of the time I'm talking to folks about um, six high level keys or, or steps, if you will, to uh, validating temperature controlled units. And, um, you know, they're just simple and practical tools that uh, are easy to understand and implement um, because too much complexity reduces uh, your effectiveness, right? So, in other words, making sure that your work is performed in the most appropriate and efficient manner. Um, so one of the, the first step that I, that I talk about is knowing what temperature mapping is, right? So, um, you know, temperature mapping, um, also known as thermal mapping, is 
an activity that's performed on controlled temperature chambers that record or map out the temperature within the chamber over a specified period of time. So number two would be um, knowing the prerequisites, you know, asking the right questions when it comes to uh, putting together a qualification document for um, a controlled temperature unit, um, you know, asking the right questions. For example, do you have an O&M manual? Uh, what's the make model serial number for each unit? Uh, do you have a qualification uh, document template or are you requiring us to develop one on our own? So uh, go, you know, go through several different questions uh, as part of the prerequisite to put you in the, the right place to prepare that documentation. Um, another one would be knowing and understanding what might be in, in a URS for a, a temperature control chamber. Um, the fourth one would be physically seeing the unit prior to starting your qualification, uh, laying your eyes on the unit, going out and doing an equipment walk down, verifying that the unit's installed uh, properly, uh, verifying that the, the shelves are installed, verifying that the calibration was actually done. Um, you know, is the sensor probe in the proper location according to the manufacturer? So physically seeing the unit prior to even starting. Uh, the fifth step that I talk about is knowing the sensor's uh, locations uh, and considerations for temperature mapping. So do you know where the sensors go? Do you know how many to put in the, in the unit and why? So learning and knowing that. Uh, the sixth step that I talk about is knowing and understanding what a basic temperature mapping protocol should contain, right? So what is in the IOQ, um, you know, from, from creating the document, uh, the purpose and scope, um, you know, what are the test sections that are involved in the IQ, um, you know, verifying the, the equipment utility installation, um, um, attaching the documentation, the manuals, the SOPs. Uh, do you have the calibration certs? Um, you know, what test instrument are you going to be utilizing during this IOQ? And is that uh, attached to this, uh, to this document? Um, what are the OQ sections, operational qualification uh, alarms? Your, your mapping studies, empty, loaded? Are you performing an open door and power fail? So we know what exactly is in an, in, um, an IOQ qualification protocol. So those are the, the top six things that I kind of I share I, and I teach um, those who are learning to get into uh, validation um, and, and temperature mapping. And I teach them, I, I've put a, a training manual together uh, that goes over these six steps and hopefully with that information you know people are um, gaining the the understanding of what they need to do when um, temperature mapping chambers before we continue to the next question let me thank you pre again for sponsoring this event if you want to upgrade your data loggers, you should know that UPRI's wireless temperature data logger constantly sends data to web-based software via Wi-Fi. It provides real-time temperature reports of your refrigerator, freezer, storage area, etc. For ultimate compliance, once temperature deviation happens, it will immediately send you an SMS and email alarm which minimizes the risk during the monitoring process. So make sure to visit them at upri.com. It's eupry.com later today. Great. Thanks for this overview. So which of the steps would you say is the most challenging for people to handle and why? Great question, Jan. So I got to say the most challenging uh, for people to handle and why would be, uh, well, I would say the, the number one most asked question is how do you determine the number of sensors for mapping? So I think the, the most challenging thing for people is just knowing how many sensors um, and, and where to put them, um, whether that's in a, in, a, in a freezer, an incubator or, or refrigerator. Um, or I think maybe that question um, stems from places like uh, larger cold rooms or warehouses, you know, how many do I, do I include in my study? Um, but I, I gotta, I gotta say that uh, when it comes to the number of sensors uh, and positions for temperature mapping, um, 
I would say to, I recommend to refer to the ISPE guide, uh, good practice guide on controlled temperature chambers. They do speak about um, how many sensors uh, to use and what size chamber um, to use them in. So they, they, they do break it down for you. Um, I also know that uh, the WHO guidelines um, also break down the, uh, the space and size requirements and number of, of sensors um, broken out by, by space um, in, in their guideline. Um, all, all of which we can, uh, we can provide folks listening to the podcast. We can provide the references. Um, but, but yeah, I would have to say the most challenging for people would be knowing the, the placement of TCs or sensors and, um, and, and how many to, to add to their qualification. Uh, you, you quickly asked me, you know, why that would be. I, I just think it's as simple as um, maybe just, just not knowing. Um, not being familiar or having the experience um, with multiple qualifications under your belt. Um, have you read the guidelines? Do you know them? Um, I would recommend check them out, read over them. Um, and then it's a, it's a matter of doing it, right? So how many chambers have you mapped? Um, how many warehouses have you actually had to map? Um, in my line of business uh, on the consulting side, I've not only had to to um, write protocols, execute the protocols, place the sensors, uh, calibrate the sensors, um, but I've had to provide um, proposals or quotes to get the work done. So for me, it's it's a little bit different because I, I'm seeing it all the time and I, I kind of have to know that information in order to provide the proper pricing and things like that. So, um, but, but yeah, I think that's the most challenging. The reason why it's just because, you know, they don't know, or it's, they just haven't had enough exposure to it, but that's, that's, uh, I think it's, it's remedied by, you know, just getting out there and doing it and, uh, and reading up on those guidelines. Perfect. That's totally valuable information. What can you tell me about the most common mistakes people make during the validation and, uh, most importantly, how to avoid them? Sure. Another good question. Um, I think that uh, there's lots of there's lots of uh, common mistakes that that people make, um, but I think that maybe the most common mistake would probably be uh, good documentation practices (GDP). Right. So, um, you know, documenting information at the time of execution, uh, filling out the uh, the temperature mapping diagram at the time of placing the TCs or the, or the sensors, uh, providing the, the proper comments, attaching the documents um, with the, the, right, the right information, uh, t- um, writing you know, uh, the proper um, notations on the document, um, initial and dating in the right spot. So I, I got to think that the most common mistake people make is uh, based on good documentation practices. So you know, for folks listening, uh, go out and um, do some training, get some training, get a refresher. Uh, those managers, um, those directors out there, you know, give your people a refresher on GDP. Uh, it will it will help in the long run, that's for sure. Now, there are other mistakes that people make, you know, uh, when it comes to validating, whether it's uh, calibration mistakes or, you know, not placing the sensors in the right location or maybe pinching the the wires causing you know um, you know a, a failure um, but so there's there's other mistakes out there but I gotta think that the most common mistakes people make are down to uh, good documentation practices and I think a lot of that can be resolved by um, some some training uh, and refresher courses that's what that's what I believe anyway excellent I hope our audience adheres to your advice and avoids those issues altogether. Before we finish today's talk, can you share your go-to resources for staying current with regulations and best practices in this domain? I would say in order to stay up to date with the latest regulations and trends, a good place to start would be to involve yourself in the industry groups that are out there. Uh, What I mean is the ISPEs of the world or, or other associations uh, you can follow regulatory agencies or companies on on social media. LinkedIn, for example, uh, is is a good place uh, to follow people for all things temperature mapping related. You can follow me 
Um, you can attend conferences and even talking to your peers and networking helps you stay current and involved. And that's, that's my route. Um, I stay involved or stay in the know because uh, you just, I'm always um, online looking up information, um, seeing what is um, available that I can put out there. Um, what knowledge have, do I have that I can provide to others um, and, uh, and just staying constantly connected. Thanks a lot for re revealing your resources. And Nathan, would you like to share your contact information with us again in case someone from the audience would like to ask you some questions or require about consultancy? Sure, absolutely, Jan. Uh, anyone who is listening to the, the podcast um, would, that have questions or would require some, some assistance in, in temperature mapping, um, you can reach out to me um, through my email address, nroman at genesisaec.com, or they can look me up on LinkedIn. Um, my name is Nathan Roman, so N-A-T-H-A-N-R-O-M-A-N. -A -A they can find me on LinkedIn. Um, most of the content that is out there that I'm sharing is temperature mapping related, um, qualification uh, minded. So you can uh, you can f you can connect with me there, um, or I'm sure Jan with this podcast um, there'll be a link that um, you can provide folks that have uh, have our information, our, our you know a little bit of our, our profile in the bio or something. So yeah, absolutely, that'd be great. Nathan, thanks a lot for another highly informational discussion. I'm looking forward to talking to you again about other thermal validation topics in the near future. Have a great day ahead of you. John, thank you so much for allowing me the opportunity again to speak um, and share a little bit about uh, what I'm interested in. Uh, my passion's always been to to help people, and I hope that what we do here is uh, is doing just that, is helping others. So I really appreciate it, and we'll talk to you again.